Thursday. It's Thursday, June 6th. I'm Adam Walsh, and this is The Signal. Here's a question for you. How much should politicians make? Now, that can be your town councilor, your MHA, your MP. What should their salary be? And here's another question. What's the cost of being in politics? That one, not necessarily about money. That's the conversation for today, though. And why are we talking about this? Well, through the spring, there was a fair bit of chatter around politician pay, right? You had federal politicians getting a pay bump. MPs now make over $200,000 a year. The PM tops 400000 Here in this province, there was a new report. Uh, the 2024 Members' Compensation Review Committee recommended MHAs make an annual salary of 120000 about a 25000 increase from current rates, which have been frozen since uh, 2009. That report, by the way, called How We Value Democracy. And uh, that's really the focus of today's conversation, right? How we value democracy. What what should we be spending on it? What's it worth? Who do we want to have involved? If you've got thoughts as you're listening, the text line is open, 709-327-8206. So give us your texts uh, or email us, thesignal at cbc.ca. Joining me now in studio for the conversation for today, we've got uh, Mum Political Science Professor Kelly Bladuk. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for coming in. Kate Cadigan, uh, co-chair, Equal Voice. And you're also with the Political Science Society. I am. Yeah. And nice to... Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming in. And, uh, it, the, you know, Mount Pearl's MHA, Mount Pearl and Southlands. Paul Lane, how you doing? Doing great. Thanks for this. Appreciate you being here. Glad to be here. And I was, we were just saying the preamble uh, before the, you know, the, the show started. How long have you been in MHA now for? Uh, working on my 13th year. I've got 12 full years uh, as of the uh, this past fall. So uh, I'm working uh, into year 13 now. Year 13. How, yep. Wh- what's that like? How you doing with it? Uh, I still love it. Yeah. Uh, I still get up every day and enjoy what I'm doing. And I think uh, anybody would tell you in any type of job, no matter what it is, uh, is that if you can get up in the morning and uh, enjoy taking on your day and enjoy doing your job, then... Uh, why would you, uh, at that point in time, I, I suppose we all have to give up at some point, mm. but uh, right now I'm, in, uh, I'm loving it, and um, I, I, for the foreseeable future, I can't see me doing anything else, to be honest oh. with you. I mentioned that bit, how we, that question, like, or a statement, I should say, how we value democracy. So when you think of democracy, mm-hmm. like, how do you value it? Like, what's the value centers around it, like, from, like, what we put into it to what we should be getting out of it as someone who's been, you know, Baker's dozen of years as, as an MHA plus community involvement before then? Well, I mean, I look at some of the other uh, nations around the world that uh, do not have democratic institutions. And, uh, and I thank my lucky stars that, uh, that I'm living here in this wonderful country and this wonderful province. Uh, I, I think that uh, democracy is very important to uh, any society, very important to our society. Uh, I don't know if you can put an actual dollar amount on it uh, yeah. per se. I suppose that's always somewhat subjective. But I would say that uh, it, it, it is important that we invest in democracy in our democratic uh, institutions. But by the same time, we also need to ensure that the taxpayer is reaping the benefit of that investment. And that's why it's very important that we have the appropriate checks and balances in place to hold uh, governments and and politicians in general uh, to account, Mm. uh, because it is the the people's money that's being spent uh, to maintain these institutions. Kate Cadigan, what do you think? Yeah, I think I would just echo um, MHA Lane on that. I think democracy is super important and we're very lucky to have it, but it is something that we need to take care of at the same time um, and invest in it properly. Um, Like MHA Lane said, the taxpayers are definitely something to consider when you're looking at um, the salaries for any politician, whether that's municipal, provincial or federal. Um, So I think it's definitely a balance Mm. there. Yeah. And, and, you know, I said your co-chair of Equal Voice. Remind folks about Equal Voice and what that is. Yeah, so Equal Voice is a not-for-profit organization that promotes women and gender-diverse individuals in all levels of civics. So um, municipal, provincial, federal, and also band um, councils. So we work um, with women and gender-diverse people across the province, but also nationally, Mm. to educate them on some of the barriers, to empower them to put their name forward and kind of get out there. But we are still working 
um, to find ways that we can kind of creatively break down those barriers because they're not easy to get around. Yeah, no, no, of course. Why did you want to uh, get involved with this? With Equal Voice? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I grew up in a house that was pretty political. CBC was always on the TV and playing during dinner time. So I was kind of aware of things as I was growing up. But you... You look on the TV and you don't always see someone that looks like yourself. Mm. Um, so as I started to grow up and become more involved with the community and now studying political science and gender studies, um, it kind of seemed like the perfect intersection of all the things that I'm passionate about. Um, and it, it really is a great tool for for people out there to use um, to get their name out there and just educate themselves, honestly. Mm. Professor Bledu, what about yourself? How did I get involved in this? Yeah, yeah. How did you get here today, <laughs> other than me bothering you weeks uh, ago? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, this is a topic that uh, I'm interested in as well. You talk about sort of the, the value of democracy. Um, and I'd say as well, I, I think it, it's hard to put a, a dollar value, uh, but I'd I, I, um, sort of qualify that and say I think we need to avoid uh, thinking of how we can make things cheaper, which I think is usually the bias that you that you deal with, with a lot of the commentary you get around politicians, around taxes, around a lot of other things. And that's not to say that we should always be spending lots of money, uh, but that we should think of democracy as something that is both precious and fragile. Uh, and that when we're not careful, when we don't take good care of it, you know, think about just your car, that the fact that there's constant maintenance, that there are costs that sometimes you don't see right away the, the benefit from them. But if you continuously say, well, let's just spend less, let's just not spend money now, uh, let's, let's put this aside and not worry about it, eventually you're going to have a really big bill or you're going to have to toss it out and get something different. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think any of us wants to toss out democracy and get something different. Most of us, I think. You know, I think that's a safe <laughs> thing to say, yeah, uh, at, at least for the folks here in this room uh, right now. So then when stuff comes out about in the, in the like, in the media or in the news, uh, when it circles around about politician pay, right? So we're hearing, like I said, there uh, MPs making over two hundred thousand, or the look at this province, right? Salaries frozen since '09. What should the conversation be around this, right? Because we're going to have folks like, I, for example, I just got an email uh, from uh, a listener. Uh, here's the subject: salaries. They make plenty across the board with all uh, the bennies and perks. Once they all sign their parliamentary docs, they play the same game. Cronyism, nepotism, and patronage rule against what average people make, including mun profs. They are uh, well off. So this is an opinion that is out there, right? Just got sent into the inbox. What do you think of that? And then what do you think about the conversation that should be, which jumps onto what you're saying, Professor Pladuk, uh, around democracy and where we should be at for, for what folks should be paid and compensated for? Well, you know... I can only speak for myself, of course. Um, I would say that uh, in terms of the remuneration that I receive, uh, I'm satisfied with, with what I receive. Um, when I put my name on the ballot to run, uh, I knew up front what the salary, what the benefits were, mm -hmm. and I still made that conscious choice to continue to uh, run for public office. Uh, now, you know, with that said, uh, I think anybody would say that, um, you know, if there has not been any increase in 2009, I don't know if anybody in any profession um, would necessarily say that that's right and proper. I think anybody, any reasonable person uh, would expect that over time you would see some sort of an increase. I think the challenge... Um, for 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 us as as uh, legislators here, is that the process itself? Um, I have to actually go into the House of Assembly and vote my own self a raise. Now, <clears throat> albeit there was a totally independent process yeah. um, that that took place by qualified individuals. Um, I personally did not even participate uh, in it at all because I wanted to be totally unbiased and not have any influence whatsoever. Um, the recommendations, people know what the recommendations are. I do see some merit in that recommendations, uh, but I've said publicly now a number of times, I think this whole idea of uh, voting myself a $25,000 raise is not something that... I'm comfortable with not something I'm prepared to do. I could possibly be comfortable with a lesser amount, but if at the end of the day we just simply said on a go-forward, one of the recommendations is on a go-forward basis, 
MHA salaries would be just tied to um, to the cost for inflation. Yeah, to inflation. Um, and then that would be the end of it. There would be no more reviews necessary, no more voting raises. I'd be satisfied with that. Um, but, you know, depending on who you ask, people are going to have their own views. There's a lot of people hurting out there right now, really struggling. And uh, I think that when they... They see this, and let's face it, politicians generally are not held in uh, in the highest regard by a lot of the public. So I think it just infuriates people when they see it, and you're going to have those type of negative reactions regardless. Yeah, and even with the inflation bit, if if, if it gets paid to inflation, mm. when like things like social assistance for the province are not, like you can see how it can generate lots of different uh, opinions. What, what do you folks think? Yeah, I, I would have to agree. I think... Um, nine years is, or more than nine years is a long time since 2009. That's a long time to go with the same salary. But at the same time, it, it is kind of a shock, I would think, to the public sometimes to see that, that increase when there are people out there who are struggling. Um, but that's not to say that it's not needed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, with a raise, right? What, like, what's the point of, like a like there's there's the looking at the cost of from no race since 09, right fine and yeah. like there's a discussion of and i think uh, across the province for legislatures newfoundland and labrador somewhere in the middle still the highest paid in atlantic canada from what i was looking at this morning but there is that cut discussion around well hey it's been a while should we look at this but what's the point of having salaries where they are anyways what's the hope for getting folks involved in politics by having salaries where they are, in this case, uh, you know, a fair bit higher? Like, what are we, for recruiting, why do we want to have these levels? Uh, Professor Bledu? Uh, well, so uh, so there's a few different studies out there around sort of the effect of salaries. Um, uh, and uh, just, again, to go back to something that uh, uh, Pauline was saying earlier, it, it's really odd to have to sort of ask the MHAs, to ask the people in these positions to make the decision, which they know there's already sort of a negative perception of pol politicians generally, mm -hmm. and then these politicians are the ones charged with making the decision. I, I really wish that at some point in the past we'd simply done exactly this. We'd said, here's what the salary is going to be, but also here's how it's going to increase. So we don't have to have this politics around the salaries of politicians. Yeah, it could be the stuff. same thing for like, oh, I don't know, planes for prime ministers or official residences. and up, like There's discussions around, sure. like it's always a hard thing to, to put forward because you like, there's no winning for you if you're a politician around that. Well, and I don't think people realize that the natural state of these things is deterioration, which is why now 24 Sussex, the, like, the actual place where the prime minister lives, we're basically talking about throwing it out because yeah. we, we were always afraid to spend more money and actually take care of it. Everyone for it's years. It's the same yeah. thing that's been going on here. So if we had gone back to 2009 and if we had had a, a 1.5% increase, less than inflation on average over those years, 1.5% increase, and if we'd done that every year, we'd actually have the amount we're talking about in the report. That's what it would have come out as. It would right. have been fine. Nobody would have gotten upset about it. But the fact that every year we say, oh, well, this isn't a good year to do it. Oh, well, this isn't a good year to do it. Oh, well, other people didn't get a raise this year, which isn't necessarily true. Uh, suddenly we're in this position where it's like, oh, well, now we have to have to do an increase, which is over 25 percent all at once. Right. Mm. Um, I think that what we want, uh, and sorry, to just go back to the point about different studies that have been done on this, uh, one thing we know for a fact is that uh, increased salaries tends to increase competition. Uh, I think increased competition would be a very good thing generally. It doesn't necessarily mean that you always get better people. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, uh, you know, and people have studied this just by looking at sort of the qualifications. So if you increase the salaries, do you get people with, for example, more university degrees or more, more years of experience in a given uh, area or something like this? Uh, not necessarily the case. There's some conflicting evidence around that. But on the whole, I think that this is kind of the point is that if we, if we have salaries that are competitive, we get competitive people, just like you do in any other job. Uh, if, you, if you keep dropping the salary, you're going to get different people applying for it. And that's not to say that we don't want a wide cross-section of society who hold these positions, but I do think we want to make sure that we're not also making it something where lots of people, uh, just put myself in that group, I would never run for office. I just, mm. right now, given I'm not independently wealthy, I'm not a landlord, I don't have all these other possible sources of income, I can't afford the pay cut. I'm just not in a position to do it. Mm. Uh, and there's lots of people who would say it's kind of the same thing. But you, you, tend, you are tending, like, like your email said, like university professors, they make more than the average person. Doctors do, lawyers do, um, and people who are at higher levels of experience, teachers, uh, you know, people in public service. All these people really probably can't take the pay cut that it would take to run for office, and that may be a limiting factor, right? 
Kate, what do you think, right? If you're with Equal Voice trying to get uh, more diversity, uh, more women, more gender diverse folks into politics, about pay versus just the, the, the like the trying to recruit more uh, diverse folks to sit in the seats of uh, elected uh, office? Yeah, I think um, like we've done some research, Equal Voice itself, on kind of um, how we're going to get to that point and what, what is the limiting factor. And the research that's been done has shown that it actually starts at the candidate level. Like the first barrier for women is actually getting themselves to run. So, of course, you can look at the salary and say, OK, at that point, would they be t- taking a pay cut or, you know, an increase in their pay? But before that, we even get there for many women and gender diverse um, people out there, just even putting their name forward is the biggest barrier. Um, so and that includes personal cost, like family life personal life, professional life, but also financial costs, which can be which can be um, intense when you're running an election. So MHA Lane, your first kick at it, uh, when you, so 13 years ago when you're getting elected, the entry point for politics and costs, right? The cost that you have to bear. What's that like? Well, I will say, first of all, that um, when I first ran for politics, um, I took a pay cut yeah. to run. It wasn't a huge pay cut, but I did take a pay cut because it was something that I just felt I wanted to do. I wanted to try to make a difference. I was a community guy, I guess. Still am, yeah. uh, to the core. And uh, it was sort of a natural progression from the volunteer world to the city council world to uh, to provincial. Um, but um, but there are there are a lot of costs um, to, uh, to to be in an MHA to be in a public person, uh, a lot of costs that people don't see in intangibles I guess uh, we'll call them, uh, in terms of uh, some of the stress and pressure um, that not just that you would feel um, as an individual but that your family your 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 spouse your significant other your children. Um, you know, we've had MHAs, uh, particularly ministers, uh, I can think of a couple, you know, that have had death threats, Yeah. that their children have received death threats, that they've been mocked in school, uh, that neighbors, you know, have uh, attacked them and, you know, and, and attacked individuals and, and said things because of their role as a minister or uh, as an MHA. Um, you know, the fact that... Simple things like not being able to go to the grocery store with your spouse and pick up groceries uh, without perhaps many times he or she sitting in the parking lot uh, in the vehicle while you're still in the store talking to somebody for about 15 or 20 minutes or a half hour about some particular issue that comes up. So the fact that you can't necessarily go on a staycation the same as anybody else because no matter where you go in the province try to unwind try to relax people know you and people are still coming up asking you things which you know there's a lot of uh it does take its toll on personal and family life now when you sign up for it or Mm. certainly maybe somebody new signing up to it may not realize but certainly when you do the job and you choose to sign up again you know what you're getting into and you have to balance that. And it's something that I've been able to balance and I'm able to handle. I've had to grow a thick skin over the years. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my family have, you know, had to pay had, had to pay a price. And I would say any MHA's family have to pay uh, a price for their spouse's uh, or their father or their grandfather's notoriety. No doubt about it. Yeah, look, I'm just a lunchtime radio host. Yep. I know I, it takes me a while to get through sometimes if I go out grocery shopping uh, because you, you run into folks you've interviewed or sometimes folks will just want to chat about an idea for or talking about something that's in the news or CBC stuff. That is not an elected politician thing. So like I like when I think about what you must and other MHAs or if you're an MP or you're, you're you know town council or something, the amount of times that you must have to wait because it, it's also – because it's part of your job too, but at the same time, you should you should be able to get groceries. What's the range for what? Because like I think it's the, the range for what people must be talking to you about must be for everything from like, hey, how you getting on? Good to see you. To sometimes people in crisis. To sometimes people saying stuff that perhaps they shouldn't be saying publicly. Like, is that it? You get it all. Yeah, uh, you get it all. Now I have to say, um, 
that uh, particularly over the last number of years, I, I will say particularly since I've become an independent member yeah. and I'm able to speak out on issues and call it as I see it and as I feel my constituents see it, um, a lot of the people who stop me now is more of a keep up the good work, Paul. We appreciate mm. what you're doing. That, mm. That's a good, it's a good thing. Now, you'll still get a lot of people with questions about stuff, people who are in crisis. I've had people like, you know, contact me like on Easter Sunday. I'm homeless. I, I need, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I need shelter. I mean, you know, you get everything, right? Every range. Uh, but I would say that, uh, you know, there were times, uh, you know, in the past, particularly in my earlier days, where, uh, you know, where you're wearing a lot of the party politics uh, and stuff like that. And, uh, boy, uh, people were, not everybody was very nice to you. Mm. And uh, and I know, like, ministers and stuff in particular, like in 20, uh, that infamous budget with the levy and so on. I mean, I know some of my, which that's what landed me in, in independent, ultimately, yeah. was the yeah. levy. I couldn't support it. But, uh, you know, to my colleagues that were there that uh, brought it in and the stuff, I mean, they were crucified. Mm. by people mm. and uh it's you know they were doing what they felt was best at the time i may have disagreed with them most of the public obviously probably disagreed with them but uh it still wasn't a need to be attacking them and their families personally but it absolutely happened and it's not right and it's uh one of the prices that you have to pay for uh being a public figure Unfortunately, what do you what do you folks think about that that political cost, right? That the 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 being a public person in today's world, it's not even like it went back in like you know the eighties or nineties. Now with like social media and everything else, like it and there seems to be more vitriol than there used to be. But I don't know. That's just how just from looking around. But what, what, like, what do you, uh, Professor Blue? What do you what do you think? Um, yeah, so there's a lot of costs, right? Yeah. And I think that the problem is that most of those costs aren't seen. The only thing that most people are aware of usually is some version of question period. That's the, the element that they see, and then they think, okay, so the, on the days that the House isn't sitting, these people have vacation, which is uh, really far from the truth. Uh, and certainly, Paul, again, could, could probably tell us about the whole range of things that you have to do and the time that it takes up. Uh, a colleague of mine and I actually just published an article where uh, we went into, uh, we looked at MPs in multiple countries uh, and the the efforts that they make to make connections with their constituents. So we actually spent time with people, went around with them, uh, and it's a really wide range. Of course, you've got uh, MPs in London who hold what are called surgeries, where people come in 15-minute appointments at a time and see hundreds of people through a week and try to help them with every single problem and actually write letters and those mm. sorts of things, too. Uh, I was with an MP in northern Alberta where we spent the weekend just in his truck driving 16 hours to go to one remote uh, corner of his constituency to go to a dinner um, and uh, and various little meetings that went along the way. And so there's a wide range, but mm-hmm. it's it's never sitting at home, right? It's yeah. uh, it's a lot of work. It's weekends. And like like Paul mentioned, it's also when you think you've got time to yourself, it's never to yourself. You you are on 24-7. If you leave your house, you are working. And you, you don't have an opportunity to say, sorry, I'm not working right now, right? You can't tell, <laughs> you can't tell the person who you've met in the Coleman's uh, – Thanks, but I have to go. Definitely not. Right. So uh, it's it, it, the time commitment is amazing, and the difficulty of the work, and then you add on top of that the fact that typically people are negative towards you. Uh, so there's there's a lot of additional stuff, and I'm sure Kate could also get onto how negative, how much vitriol, and how much it really hurts people. Yeah, because it, it's because it, it it's different for women and gender diverse folks in politics. Hey, eh? like yeah, yeah, for sure, for yeah. sure. So um, I have to agree with both of you. Like it. It's more than a full-time job. It becomes your life. Um, lifestyle, and, yep. Yeah, it's a lifestyle, and you are always working. Um, and like MHA Lane said about like women um, who are who are politicians or running or whatnot, their kids um, get involved, and they might be pointed out at school and all that. So it really consumes you. And, of course, it is um, like you choose, you sign up, and it is a very important job, but it definitely comes with its um, – challenges i would say and for women that's just kind of heightened you know as traditionally like historically women um haven't been as involved in politics um like only it was only a hundred years ago um this coming year that women even got the right to vote in newfoundland and labrador so you know we're still paving our way and things and so there are people out there who who unfortunately still do not see women in these leadership positions and um 
sometimes have unkind things to say. Is there a way to change, like, especially with social media from X, formerly Twitter, uh, Facebook posts, like some of that vitriol, some of the hate that is out there directed at, at Paul, like, is there a way to change how folks are reacting? Like, like how, how do you, because I, you see a lot of it, right? Is that possible? I don't know if it, <clears throat> before I answer that, I just yeah. want to make one quick point yeah, yeah, if yes, I could, please. just to go back. Um, Despite the challenges, I, I want to say this because I think it's important to say as well. Despite some of the challenges of being in public life, and you know, the in some ways your life's not your own. Whenever you walk out the door, you are kind of always on twenty four seven. But um, there is um, a lot of um, there's a lot of good that comes out of it as well. You get to help a lot of people, and it's very rewarding. So. I don't want to paint this negative picture no, no, uh, of, of of being in in politics or discourage anybody from getting there, because you just have to basically understand that these things are going to happen. It's kind of part of the job. It's human nature. It's the way it is. Unfortunately, some of it's negative, but you do get to do a lot of good. Sometimes it's a real struggle, certainly in the legislature and trying to get like policy changed and stuff like that. But in terms of the day-to-day, -day, I have people contacting me daily. They're calling my office. They're emailing. They're, actually, Facebook is messengers. To, I get probably 90% of my contacts now through Facebook messengers. It's amazing how that's kind of <laughs> evolved, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. But you get to help an awful lot of people. And I've got so many good stories and a lot of good feelings here in the old ticker of I can think of of people I've been able to help. Yeah. seniors and, and people who have been disadvantaged or people who have had difficulty navigating the system, the bureaucracy, and so on. So um, there's an awful lot of good, and we can't forget that. And yeah. that's why that's what drives you to continue on. And, well, and I was wondering, could you just run us through, like, um, what's a week like for you? Because, like, like we said, like uh, <clears throat> Professor Blue, like Kelly was saying, uh, under, you know, people know question period. They understand when, like, the House is sitting type of a thing and hear mm -hmm. stuff on the news. People ask really good questions with really good answers back and forth. And uh, and, and then uh, there's all the uh, other time. You mentioned the grocery store. But what's the, what's a, a week like for you for, for work? Well, um, you know, every week – one thing about it is that it's never boring, I suppose, because there's always something different uh, happening. But I, I guess, like, uh, I, I do spend a lot of time, uh, an awful lot of time. Uh, I do have a constituency assistant, as do all MHAs. But, uh, you know, as an MHA, you also got to be personally involved. A lot of times people don't want to talk to your constituency assistant. They're saying, I elected the MHA. That's who I want to talk to. Um, I, I just came from a meeting. That's why I was a couple of minutes late getting here. Yeah. I was an hour and a half or so in meeting with a constituent on the, on an issue she was having in the office. So, you know, every day you're uh, meeting with constituents or you're talking to them on the phone or you're conversing with them somehow, communicating with them. Uh, in addition to that, um, you know, uh, there's research that you want to do. Like, like for me... Uh, because I'm an independent and I don't have that machine behind me, um, whereas the political parties, for example, like they have a critic for every department. I have to be the critic for everything. I'm the, you know, I'm the critic for every department. <laughs> so there's a lot of reading and research and stuff to understand all of the issues, whether it be in health care or home care or, or, or education, whatever. And then, of course, um, from a community point of view, uh, I, I just look at Mount Pearl. There are so many community groups and organizations uh, and sporting groups. And so, like, I don't know over the years how many medals I've had to present to kids, <laughs> how many times I've had to speak at events, how many Chamber of Commerce luncheons I've had to attend, how many Lions Club functions, how many every community festival that goes on. You're there, and uh, every church supper, and every uh, you know, you, you name it. Mount Pearl Seniors Independence Group are constantly have. So, just uh, attending all those functions, which you're usually invited to them all. Most of the times, you're asked to speak at them or to participate in some way, and that itself is 
almost a full-time job. Yeah. And then, of course, like I say, you're dealing with all your constituency issues on top of that. And then you're also trying to keep abreast of the bigger policy issues and provincial issues and your writing ministers and your preparing petitions and getting petitions ready and signatures. And there's so there's a whole – this whole idea that you're not doing anything if the House is closed is absolutely – False, absolutely false. Do you, uh, before we move back to the other two, just when it comes to some of these events, are, like, yes, it's it's work and you're you're busy and stuff. Like, or is it, what once you kind of is there anything like in Mount Pearl that you really look forward to each year that you're like, I know you like it all, but is there anything really like you know what or that church dinner like every year this is fantastic. <laughs> There's lots of great events in Mount Pearl. I love, <laughs> I, I, I love, I love the Frosty Festival. I will say that yeah. I, I love the Frosty Festival. Um, probably one of, them, and I, I hate to start picking favorites because I don't want to get anybody mad at you me. You can see a bunch near the top. Uh, fair, but, but but I, I I will say this: um, any event associated to the Mount Pearl Special Olympics, yeah. Every time I leave there, uh, my heart is full. Every time it just gives you that. Special feeling, mm-hmm. whether it be to one of their uh, their awards night or their summer their, their their closing dinner or their Christmas party or their Valentine's dance or um, I, I've gone out to Grand Falls and stuff and watched them play their, their uh, in the um, the the um, Newfoundland Games for mm-hmm. Special Olympics and stuff like that, interacted with them all, and that's the one that's really hits me in the old ticker, I'll say again, <laughs> uh, is Special Olympics. Okay. But we have wonderful groups, organizations, and wonderful uh, uh, events and so on, and I enjoy doing all of it. Hmm. But i got to say that one is special to me, just on a personal note. All right. You're listening to The Signal. I'm Adam Walsh. Today, we're, a couple of things we're talking about, right? How much should politicians make? And we're also asking about what is the cost of being in politics? And the, the underlying bit for this conversation is the question of, like, how do we, what's the value that we put on, on democracy? If you've got thoughts as you're listening to us, text us, 709-327-8206. Emails the signal at cbc.ca. And you can always call the signal line and leave a message, 709-576-5260. Here with me in studio, we've got MUN political science professor Kelly Bladuk, uh, Kate Cadigan, who's co-chair of Equal Voice. And you were just listening to MHA Mount Pearl Southlands, Paul Lane. I've got a piece of tape I want to play because we... I was just curious about what folks out on the street would say if we just asked that, uh, you know, it's kind of a weird question to get on the street, you know, like, what, what do you think politicians should make without giving them any numbers or anything else? So we sent uh, uh, the CBC's Madison Ryan out on this mission, and uh, here's what we got back. Take a listen. Uh, well, I think they all have a fair bit of education behind them. Uh, they sometimes do a lot to contribute to the economy and to you know, the communities and stuff. They no doubt have a very hectic schedule with a lot of commitments. I mean, maybe not $150,000, but like, yes, of course, with all the pressure and everything they're under, all the scrutiny, the telescope, you know, they're under a magnifying glass all the time, you know? So, you know, I think anybody who's in that type of position deserves to have a fair salary just as much as the next person. My name is Lori Clark and I'm from St. John's. Mm, I don't know about that. (laughs) So in your opinion, how much money do you think a politician should make? Well, if they earn their money, they probably don't get enough, but some of them don't earn their keep, so to speak. So um, I think they're doing okay. (laughs) Can we get your name? Could you just introduce yourself? Um, My name is Mrs. Lewis. Teachers should be paid more in the classrooms and the way they spend their money uh, should be checked by the people. I don't agree with a lot of the spending. The Premier right now, he makes $160,000 a year. What do you think about that? Okay, if it was his only salary, but I know he's paid for an awful lot more than 160, an awful lot more than 160. Can we get your name, if you don't mind? Uh, Christine. And your last name? Drover. All I know is you get paid what you're worth. What you're worth. It should be fair, if anything. And if it's not fair, then we need to fix it. Mm-hmm. So each industry is different, and it's it's a sliding scale with everything. As the economy goes up and down, I mean, it, it will change, you think. Mm-hmm. If you're dealing with more stuff, then you should get paid more. Like people, I'm sure that people who are in politics are trying to make a difference. And that's why they're in the position. So 
money hopefully is not the motivator. It's a great benefit to it. But making the difference above all is truly why we hope that someone takes that position. I'm Michelle Lee or Michelle Daly. My husband is going to be very mad. I just got married, Michelle Daly, <laughs> and I own Bodhi Hot Yoga. I think you'll be fine, Michelle. Uh, thanks, uh, well, uh, Maddie, thanks for getting that tape together. And thanks to everyone who uh, gave us their input. So a bit of a nice range there, right? Like some of what you might have expected, but talking about, oh, folks are under a magnifying glass, talking about some, earning their keep, not earning their keep. Um, bit of thoughts around the premier salary. I mean, I know there's been report, like talk of him when he's in for the surgery theater as well, but like, you know, there is his $160,000 for that. But I like the, the that comment because of it, it just, it's illustrative of some of the thoughts that people will have around politician pay and then also a bit on making a difference at the end. Any thoughts on the, on the tape that we just heard? Kelly, we'll go with you. Well, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think I think we also, there's a, bit, a fair bit of vagueness, right? Yeah, Things yeah. like what we should pay people, what's fair and so on. I, hey, I completely agree with fairness. I think yeah. we all do. Um, but but beyond that, I mean, okay, so, you know, my bias, I think, is out there. I actually think that we should we should spend a fair bit uh, on on our MHAs. I'd be perfectly happy to take the exactly what's being recommended, the 120. I think that'd be perfectly reasonable. Um, but I guess, yeah, the other thing I think is, again, just going back to sort of understanding the full scope. So, I mean, if we're going to talk about that the premier makes more money doing things, I mean, is it reasonable that as a surgeon that he is still doing surgeries mm. and when he does surgeries that he has paid for them? Yeah. Um, I think that's actually perfectly fine. I know that I've got plenty of criticisms about the premier, but that is not one of them. Yeah. Um, but I also, you know, I could I could also get behind someone who says, well, okay, but but what other income sources do MHAs have? Uh, you know, should we be sort of checking to make sure that their work is, you know, for me, I'd go back around to the fact that none of these jobs can be done if somebody is, uh, for lack of a better term, half-assing it. Mm. Uh, I've only ever met, uh, in my time uh, studying MPs, I've only ever met one MP who basically said straight up that they were half-assing it, and they didn't get the job the next time around. <laughs> uh, the rest of them aren't doing that. And that MP uh, did tell you that to your friend? One of them told me, this job really isn't that hard. You don't actually have to do that much. Oh, my gosh. Um, I won't say who it was, but people who take a certain course with me get to find out. <laughs> when um, is this course being offered? Uh, I need to get back to Mun, uh, even though I have a poli sci degree. <laughs> um, yeah, come take Intro to Canadian. Hey, well, hey, maybe I'll get a better grade than the first time. <laughs> it was it was shocking to me to be sitting there and having someone say, you don't really have to go to many events. You don't have to do very much. But this was someone who didn't even get their candidacy for their party the next time around. They just weren't they weren't working the way, with the sorts of things that, that Paul and every other yeah. person who does this job will tell you it takes. And again, I'll go back to what I was saying before. It's not to be negative about it. It's to be realistic about it. People should understand what the job entails, what the risks are, uh, what the benefits are, uh, and, and understand, yeah, it's an opportunity to do big things. But it's also, uh, it, it costs a lot. It takes a lot of time. Uh, people who are working 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week have no idea the number of hours that their politicians put in. Mm. Kate? Yeah, I would, I would have to agree, especially um, there was a few comments made about, like, uh, fairness, like you you said, Dr. Bliduk, like, and I don't know who decides really what is fair, like, to... I'm sure all four of us sitting around this table might have a different idea about what is fair under the scope of like what they should make. But again, at the same time, um, these people, these politicians put, put themselves out there. It's a lot on them to do it, but it's also really great work and they deserve to be compensated for the great work that they are doing. Um, but also of course the challenges as well. Paul. Um, I'm kind of shocked by the comments, to be honest with you. I thought they, I thought they were a lot kinder than what I was expecting. Yeah. i, I got to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you just, know, I think it's because I didn't put the poll out over X and Twitter, right? Uh, so, maybe yeah. that's what it is, yeah. right? But uh, a lot of the comments I'm used to hearing around are more like, you know, uh, increase. Your salary should be rolled back. You should be getting half of what you're getting and all this kind of stuff. That's what you hear a lot. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I thought the comments that I heard seemed fair and balanced and, and, and reasonable while not totally specific on the number. I think, um, I think that most fair minded people would kind of, you know, uh, agree with that. Um, as I, as I said from the beginning, I, I'm, you know, I knew what I was getting when I signed up and I'm comfortable with that, but I do feel there needs to be a mechanism, certainly on a go forward basis, uh, to take into account uh, inflation and so on, and I think that's what's being uh, recommended. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, 
I, 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 I was, again, I was surprised <laughs> <laughs> by the niceness of some of those comments. Could I just jump in? <laughs> yeah, too? Please, Somebody yeah. also in there said, I uh, would hope that they wouldn't get into it for that reason. I, I also fully agree. I, money should not be the motivating factor, but it is a reality of any job that any of us takes. I, I assume you like what you do and you're doing it not because the salary was a given amount, but because it was a, a career trajectory you wanted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'd say the same thing for myself, right? Uh, certainly it helps if you have to go to post-secondary school for 11 years, you're hoping there'll be some additional payback for the time. Not to make people worry about whether I'm getting paid well enough, because obviously nobody's caring about that. <laughs> but I'm just... <laughs> I, I care about I'm just I'm just, you know, I would make the point that I think we go into the things we want because we care about them, assuming we have the opportunity, assuming there aren't other barriers, which can also be be part of the problem, but that we go into these things because we care. And I think that that's, I would say in my experience, I have never met anybody who it seemed like they got into politics because this was their cash cow. Yeah. Uh, it's That also is just something I've never, never seen or, or heard about. So, Well, again, I can say for myself... Um, you know, when I first got in, it did represent uh, a cut in pay. Not a big one, but yeah. a cut in pay nonetheless. And for me, it was just sort of a natural evolution. I I never grew up aspiring to be a politician. If you look in my yearbook from Bishop's College, you won't see it there. <laughs> and um, it was, for me, it was a case of uh, I moved to Mount Pearl after I got married. Didn't know a lot of people, so I joined the Mount Pearl Lions Club. And from there, that kind of led me into the Mount Pearl City Day celebrations. We had kids. I became chair of the school council. I got on the community uh, center board and so on. And at, eventually, at some point in time, someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Paul, by you're doing like everything in Mount Pearl. You should be on our city council. I hadn't really thought of it, but I said, you know what? Why not? Let's give it a shot. And I guess the rest is history. And then municipal kind of evolved into provincial. And I love my job. I love what I'm doing. I love my community. I love helping people. Uh, I'm satisfied with what I get, but it's not for the money. Now, would I be able to take a major cut in pay and continue on? Probably not. I have bills and commitments just like anybody else. Money is not the driving factor, but you still have to be compensated for what you're doing because we all have to to live and, and, and support our families, just like everybody else. And there's a talent level required for running a municipality, running a province, running a country, right? Like, it's complicated stuff. So, like again, this goes down to some of the, for when you're looking at recruiting uh, for folks as candidates, of, of seeing about talent that you want in. Well, you know, that's an interesting one. Uh, to be honest with you, and I know that this might sound a little bit controversial to some people. Go for it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, over the years, we've always strived to try to find the captains of industry, the best and the brightest, the most well-educated, the most well-connected, and so on. And now we look at ourselves. Um, I've got people who can't get a family doctor. Our health care is in crisis. We're $15 billion uh, uh, in debt. And uh, there's an awful lot of issues. So, and so I'm, you know, I would say I would want to try to elect people that are actually, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to say now that everyone who's been elected are bad people, a lot of good people too, but you want people that are totally focused on doing what's right for the people and having a lot of common sense mm. and not having any other, um, what's the word? Uh, I'm going to say not have any other uh, distractions, potential conflicts and so on. Uh, that uh, doesn't lead to necessarily the best decisions for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. Yes, yeah, so you feel that's gotten away in the past, right? Whether for for any number of reasons, like because well, I, mean, I any... am thinking of you know, yeah. If we're talking about debt, we're looking at Muskrat Falls here. If we're talking about uh, it's multiple different governments to lead the healthcare system to be where it is now, and there's talk of investments yeah. and everything else, social determinants of health. But what's the distracting factors? Well, I mean, look, I, I just think that, look, we have experts in all of our government departments. That's why you have your deputy ministers, your ADMs, and so on. And so when we're electing people, it shouldn't just be about who's connected and who's got that uh, stellar resume. It should be uh, who is the person that is committed to the district, committed to the province, committed to doing what's right, committed to common sense. Mm. And that may or may not come with a degree or an impressive business resume. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Anyone on that? 
Yeah, I, I would like again like to echo that. I mean, di- I think like diversifying who we have um, sitting in in those seats around those tables is super important. And mm-hmm. and like um, MHA Lane said, like maybe. N- you don't have to be the most educated to necessarily be the most passionate about your community and involvement and um, the issues that are most important to the people um, in your community. So I would I would fully agree with that. That um, and of course common sense as well. But but I think um, just having a, a diverse group of people leading our cities, our provinces, and our country is is important, of course. Professor Blue, I mean, there, there's a legislation writing bit that has to be done too, right? Like in, when we talk about talent, like th- there has to be that ability. Yeah, so I, I mean, but I would, I would go back and echo everything that's been said. I think what we want is diversity. What we want is people who have a sympathy with the citizens around them. That should yeah. be the primary thing is that Correct. you care that the people around you do as well as they possibly can. Uh, and this uh, this would take us into another area, which is uh, campaign finance. Mm-hmm. Uh, who who is who is empowered by the systems we have? So I would say that's actually a, probably even a more important issue than the one we're talking about. Not to diminish what we're doing here. <laughs> can um, we do another show on that, by the way? Adam? Sure, we, I, we, I'd we, be game. Well, I'd actually, be game for that one. I can tell you. Actually, that. If, you, if you folks want to do a campaign finance show, we can easily schedule it. So you sure? I'm in. All right. All right. I'm, I'm, yeah, in. I'm not trying to shift gears or nothing. <laughs> but but I, I think it's worth pointing out right? yeah. Yeah. that that we we have a system that allows for the diversity, but at the same time, I, I would I would still yeah come back around to the fact that I think we do want expertise yeah. uh, and that we want a range of it. I think that we do. Uh, uh, this isn't to say that all of you know our MHAs should be doctors or lawyers no, or no. professors. Or yeah. I think that would actually be really dumb yeah. to have that. Uh, but I think we still want those people to potentially be have their hats in the ring just as much as everybody else. Uh, and so that's, again, I bring, come around to the idea of salary. It's to just make sure that we're not setting it so low that we either require people to be independently wealthy in order to run for office mm-hmm. so that they can say, oh, it doesn't matter what the salary is. I've got so much money anyways. Mm-hmm. Who cares? Or retired. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah that, that, that it will sort of allow for a full cross-section. Uh, and that's to say, I think that we should have people who don't have an experience with having gone to university, in fact. I think it's really important that people have that perspective of having a different lifestyle and having grown up and had different employment than someone like me or someone like yourself, right? So mm-hmm. whatever gives us that, and then beyond that, again, the campaign finance thing, and that allows them to then keep their sympathies focused on the people who elected them and for their constituency generally, and not to say, oh, but also there's these groups that need me to do certain things, I'm going to do things for them. If we can have a system like that, that's the ideal. When I look at the election calendars, right, uh, Municipal election scheduled for this province, September 30, 2025. As it stands now, the provincial one, October 14, 2025. Federal, October 20, 2025. Now, things can happen with two of them, uh, but there's elections around the corner. There's also November, and there's an election south of the border, and there's a lot of talk about health of democracy. Given everything we've been talking about today, and we talk about candidates and everything else, looking at what's coming up, how do we feel about the health of our democracy uh, and where things are at compared to where we're heading? I'm going to be careful here. I think we said earlier, I don't want to depress people, and I don't want to come across as negative about all the things we think about politics. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to think that we can do these things and encourage people to get involved, encourage people to make their voices heard, encourage people and get them to run for office. Those yeah. are the, the key things I think we want to be trying to do. Not letting everybody know how hard it is and how terrible it is and how it sucks. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, run away into the hills. Um, I'm not I'm not personally uh, comfortable with sort of, uh, I guess, the, the current health of democracy or the trajectory of democracy. I, I think that globally what we're seeing is a decrease in democracy, and I think everybody should be doing what they can to fight that. Yeah. Uh, now, I think the way that we do that is to uh, enhance uh, the, the institutions that we have, recognize how important the rule of law is. A lot of things we're really seeing break down quickly in the United States. Um, I'd like to see those trends reverse. Uh, but again, that, that requires people uh, being informed about the role of the institutions. Uh, it takes a little bit of work and education. Uh, and beyond that, it takes uh, getting involved, not just uh, not just showing up to vote on election day, but what are the things that you can do today that will make a difference in terms of how your government runs? Uh, people should be thinking about that and doing that, not just thinking of it as a, a once every four year kind of thing, which I think most people do. And Kate, you're involved, right? And you talk to other people who want to be involved. Yeah. So what is that like? We, when we talk about, so Professor Blue Kelly's are talking about the trajectory of democracy, but at the same time, I'm saying, hey, encourage folks with sympathy, with empathy to get involved with this. 
talk about what you're seeing. Well, from the youth perspective, at least, there are so many young people out there who who do want to be involved, who are involved, who are educating themselves. Um, right now, we're actually um, in youth parliament. So Newfoundland and Labrador Youth Parliament, we have 40 delegates from across the province joining us in the House of Assembly this week for mock parliament. So that is just, I would say that's a great example of, you know, young people out there who do want to... Um, you know, educate themselves and, and become involved in politics. But I also think that there is still a lack of education. And I know personally, when I went through the schooling system here, I didn't feel quite satisfied with what I learned about civic responsibility hmm. um, is maybe how I would put it. Um, again, like Dr. Bladuk said, like voting every four years isn't the only thing that you have to do. Um, there's other things that you can do if you want. Um, so I think... They're just more education. I think that's a, a great tool to teach people the importance of of that responsibility. Yeah, I like a lot of times we'll have younger folks on the show, right? So like late teens to early 20s. Yeah. And the more we talk to folks who are engaged, this could be politically like yourself or on, on the climate file and yeah. a bunch of other stuff. It it That is... It, like I think Paul would say, it, you know, it is good for the ticker type of thing, <laughs> right? Uh, as we're winding down here, MHA Lane... Uh, and to leave on a good note, tell, remind us, and you've talked about it a bit through the show, but the the, the, the stuff that really kind of inspires you or makes you feel good or the work that you do that makes it feel worthwhile for all of the everything else that you can face as an MHA. Like, what is it that keeps you going after 13 years, time and time again? Well, the big thing for me is, uh, as I said, when you are able to help uh, families and help individuals with uh, their day-to-day -day issues, and that could be issues around trying to navigate our very broken healthcare system. It could be uh, issues in our education uh, system uh, with some of our students. Um, it could be issues around uh, home care. Uh, you name it. There's any host of issues, and uh, I have so many people contacting our office on a regular basis. Who are just just hurting, and they're they're they're, you know, not only are they hurting financially and so on, but they're also struggling with the quote unquote the system. Yeah, yeah. And when you're able to help them and uh, with with their problem, solve their issue, and you can't solve them all, no doubt about it. But uh, for all the times that you get those little wins. And somebody just comes up and just says, thank you so much. Or a senior got a tear in her eye and she gives you a hug and says, you know, thank you so much. I don't know what I ever would have done if you weren't there to help me type of thing. Those are the things that you remember. Those are the things that really keep you going. Hmm. And yep. uh, so I guess you'll be dusting off the campaign signs now come uh, 2025? 100%. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going anywhere. And... Uh, uh, all comers, you want to come on and uh, and uh, take me on? Well, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. I'll do my best. I I, I feel I have a s strong record. I'm not afraid to uh, face my constituents, and uh, ultimately they, they will decide if I've done a good job or if I haven't. And uh, I'll respect their decision, whatever it is. But uh, at the end of the day, I'm not ready to go anywhere quite yet. Uh, last question: What's it like election night when you get the results? Um, it can be very nerve-wracking, yeah. um, you know, e even when you feel good uh, about it. And, uh, you know, I've had some, I've had a couple of, one in particular, very close mm -hmm. election. And that one, my stomach was a knots because one minute I was in the lead and I was behind, I was in the lead, I was behind. Uh, and that can be very, really, really hard on you. Uh, but uh, even uh, in other ones, like the last one, I did extremely well. And... Uh, and, and I knew I was, I had that feeling that it was going to go well uh, from the door knocking and everything. But until those numbers actually roll in, uh, that's when you sort of get that sense of relief. And the first set of numbers that comes in, uh, you know, that gives you a little bit of ease, but you're always waiting for that next one. Mm. And uh, once you see that next one, if the trend is starting to look good, there you go. then you can kind of relax. But up until then, it's pretty intense waiting for that. Thanks. Always is. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, great to be here. All right, folks, that was uh, Paul Lane, MHA, Mount Pearl, Southlands, co-chair, Equal Voice, Kate Cadigan, and Munn political science professor, Kelly Bladuke. Thanks, folks. Uh, that's it for the show today. 
tomorrow, here's an easy Friday show for everyone. If you want to like lock out all the news from your lives, John Gushu is going to be by for a uh, trivia day. It's uh, you know the first uh, Friday of each month, so don't miss it. Thanks for listening. Cheers.